Hello there, a very warm welcome to the manufacturer's latest webinar. My name's Nick Peters. I'm the editorial director here. The purpose of the webinar today is to illustrate how to harness the opportunities presented by digital transformation in manufacturing while mitigating the risks when it comes to security and connecting digital supply chains across the world. Before we get going, some housekeeping. There'll be an opportunity for you to ask questions about the presentation later on. We are going to be running a couple of polls. Please do take part. They're very simple, multiple choice, one click questions. By taking part, you'll be helping our presenter, Andrew McCreth, understand his audience a little bit better. In fact, let's take the first of those polls now. Interesting results from that poll. Um, uh, some people say it, about 20% say they've never heard of uh, uh, interconnection as part of a digital transformation journey. Another 20% say they're aware and it's quite important. And a very large percentage, 64%, say it's absolutely critical. Partnering and digital data exchange is vital to our future success. What do you make of that? Well, I, I think that's all highly relevant. I mean, the insights there, thank you very much for polling on those. Um, it's what we're seeing in the marketplace today. Now, I mean, the term interconnection, um, you know, we've kind of used that for many a year. Um, but you know, customers that we talk to today often think about ecosystems, uh, uh, you know, and they don't quite re realise that there's an interconnection there. It's a relationship. Um, maybe that's data sharing, etc. Um, but I'm glad to see that more and more uh, people are understanding that interconnection is critical um, because that's how you actually talk to each other. That's how you communicate with your customers, your Internet of Things, etc. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll take that knowledge, thank you very much, and we'll uh, jump into the presentation itself. So just to set the scene, um, we're gonna go through a few things today. Um, thank you very much for joining again. Uh, we're gonna give you some information as to you know, who Equinix are. Yeah, we don't want to leave you in the cold. We want to know why, you're, uh, why we're here talking to you about it. We're gonna help you understand what's impacting enterprise organizations today. Um, and how indeed companies are having to change to meet the demands of digital. Um, and then we're going to offer you some insights into the market itself, uh, from the transformational insights, how digital edge strategies are important, um, and some of the constraints and capabilities. We're then going to follow up with the three use cases uh, that we have to present today, and then people are going to take back the reins and walk us through some questions and answers. So as Peter said, please make use of the chat box for Q&A and uh, we'll come to those down, uh, down the line too. So let me start by talking about the evolution of digital ecosystems uh, and what we've seen uh, at Equinix. Um, it all kind of started for us and, and indeed uh, the internet back in uh, 1998 where, well, we were uh, in a position to look through um, being what was challenged, you know, what were the problems, uh, and we foresaw that there was nowhere that an organisation could go to deploy to multiple points uh, of the internet, uh, or multiple points of the internet. You had to go to an MCI WorldCom, you had to go to an AT and T, etc. So we set up a co-location facility to be carrier neutral, um, where the networks could come and the customer could deploy once and access multiple networks. This brought on uh, a lot of uh, interest from uh, providers uh, of web services and content and digital media um, because they could deploy one series of infrastructure and access multiple routes uh, from that. The first real digital ecosystem that we saw, however, was in the electronic trading world. And these were the organizations that needed a many-to-many -many connectivity model. Um, you can imagine the, the trading, the high frequency trading, the bank supplements, etc. Uh, it's very time sensitive. So as we moved through this journey, we saw that the clouds uh, wanted to come and obviously sell to these types of uh, enterprises. And that was really a tipping point, probably six years ago now, um, where they started deploying their digital edge uh, at an Equinix location to access more customers. From then, it's just grown. Um, we are seeing the many-to-many -many digital ecosystems growing from manufacturing, healthcare, and life sciences, um, all the way through uh, you know, to the traditional um, uh, enterprises from financial services, uh, et cetera. 
So it's a, a very growing, a very large growing ecosystem of trade today, and it spans the globe. Uh, we are, are in five continents and 24 countries, and we have over 200 data centers around the world. But we play home to nearly 10,000 customers, and we provide three, uh, 300,000 interconnections. And that interconnection is somebody wanting to have a relationship with somebody else uh, for digital supply chain, for HR as a service, or whatever it is. So that is a very large number. Um, and in fact, if you put the rest of the companies uh, put it in, providing this type of service together, they don't even come close to this volume of interconnection. And that's why companies like Google, AWS, and Microsoft, and many others um, make Equinix their home and their digital edge um, points of presence so that consumers can directly connect with these cloud services going forward. Just to give you a bit of a landscape of uh, customers that have made their home with Equinix, um, these are the companies that built out IT exchanges and control points inside and on platform Equinix. They're using platform Equinix to directly connect to each other, either physically um, or virtually using software-defined networking or our uh, Equinix Cloud Exchange fabric. These are still growing. Uh, network and finance uh, in the 20s, 20% uh, growth uh, percentile and cloud and content in the 40th. But what does this mean? Well, the platform enables you to source digital services and providers but it also helps you develop your own digital platform. But when your firm shifts to offer digital services, um, you automatically have access to the customers and partners around you, and you can connect to them dynamically. So what's the key takeaway here? All of these customers have undergone some form of digital transformation. They have leveraged an interconnection-oriented architecture to do so, and the number of companies adopting this architecture is growing rapidly. In fact, we've um, analyzed over 1,700 customer deployments around the world, um, not just with the customer and our uh, solutions architects, but also with the likes of Forrester and Gartner and said, hey, you know, this is what we see going on. Um, can we make some use cases of this? Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about those later on too. So the first important piece to understand is that the whole world has gone digital. Um, a lot is impacting our businesses today. Uh, a lot is impacting the way consumers want to engage with us. Um, and indeed, me as a consumer of applications on my phone and my desktop um, are becoming highly transactional. There are certain applications of Facebook and LinkedIn. If it crashed once a day or I had to restart it, I really wouldn't mind. But if I was uh, uh, you know, a, a new startup or uh, company, um, and I had that same experience, I would probably revert back to something I knew and trusted. And that's where we see the innovation being delivered um, and at scale um, across multiple uh, areas around the world today. A lot of the, uh, I guess, socially aware um, uh, disruptive technologies would be around lift sharing and the, the wearables that we have that tell us how many steps we've taken, calories we've burned, where we've been. Um, but even the point of sale is changing, you know, be that from the consumer experience online on how they design and configure something to where they get into a shop uh, and they can have a, a personalized experience based on information that's been gathered. Um, and indeed, we see a lot happening in connected car. Um, you know, the connected car, it's not just about autonomous driving. It's about services being delivered in vehicle, you know, be that we're just advising you, your brake pads need changing, and here are a list of local suppliers for you. So things like Spotify, uh, AirPlay, and Android Auto, etc. We also saw a lot of disruption in the uh, tourism and logistics uh, arena uh, over the past few years. You know, with Airbnb, don't own, they don't own anything, they don't sell anything, they literally uh, provide a brokerage service to rooms and hounds that uh, people can go and stay in for a fee. So that's disruption, disruption itself, and there have been many organizations that haven't quite uh, managed to pivot on these. Uh, we could look at you know, retail with Woolworths and everything that's going on in the high street today with the Arcadia Group, or we could look back on Blockbuster and Kodak and uh, you know, how they failed to transform their business. 
So what we want to make sure is that everyone has the agility and the capability to make use of these new technologies, but more than that, that they are um, not caught behind uh, the next wave of transformation. They're ready to deliver at scale, and they have, all, uh, have access to all the cloud services they need to stay agile. So in this next section, we're just going to go through uh, some of the, the messaging that we're seeing in the, uh, the market trends. Uh, we're going to talk through the current state constraints um, and give you some insights from you know, uh, research papers that we've uh, worked with Pricewaterhouse on uh, and others. So if we look through uh, what we're seeing in the market today, there obviously manufacturing digitization, it boosts revenue. Um, and it does that by being more efficient. It does that by being more cost effective. Um, it also helps to reduce costs. So we see IT organizations in the manufacturing world actually becoming more of a revenue generation center as opposed to just being a bottom line cost on the business. They're bringing in uh, adaptive printing. They're bringing in IoT and AI machine learning uh, to help the operation of the wider business. They're not just providing servers, storage, network, and telephones anymore. They're actually engaging with the business with its requirements. They're also looking to anticipate future demands. Um, it's not, like I said, it's not just about having a project and requiring some infrastructure anymore. And it's not just about strategically outsourcing it to the right person. It's about delivering a platform of capabilities, um, leveraging you know, maybe FAS, maybe infrastructure as a service and other platforms as a service, and having that built into your business operation. So that gives you a couple of areas uh, to consider. Firstly, you know, how you acquire data, how you distribute your architecture, and how you distribute your security around that architecture as well. Data allows these companies to anticipate their needs and meet them with different service offerings and go beyond the standard product delivery. The third point there uh, from the Manufacturing Trends Report PwC produced um, you know, it, it talks through the traditional competitors now partnering via interconnection to provide higher value. And we see this a lot. Um, it's, it used to be that people work through omni-channel and digitizing their supply chain for sole business efficiency. But what we're now seeing is cooperation between vendors, uh, OEM suppliers, logistics companies, and the enterprise themselves working together to provide a synergistic solution that they can take to market that benefits all parties. A true win-win. So we mentioned interconnection um, a few times and this slide really represents why interconnection is important. It's important because it's growing significantly faster than traditional MPLS and internet connectivity. It does that for a couple of reasons. Um, you imagine a network service provider in your data center or your offices, they have to deploy hardware which costs significant money um, and then they amortize that over a period of time and that's your monthly bill. So that can scale from you know, the tens of thousands upwards. The other side of it is uh, um, the internet. Um, a lot of us as users consume internet-based services, be that box on my phone, uh, you know, be that OneDrive on my laptop when I'm out and about. All of these things are very consumable and they make my job easier because I don't have to connect to a corporate network. I don't have to um, you know, leverage certain uh, restrictions um, based upon me. What I can do is simply access them. And that's going to grow. You know, that is going to grow considerably as more and more consumers adopt these services. But in connection itself um, is a much lower cost option when you're in the same data center as somebody else. It gives you the capability to provide a one gig or a 10 gigabit fiber connection directly to that person. So that means you can scale more, it means you can do more, and it means that you can provide a lower center, lower uh, latency, higher service to your customers. So manufacturing companies are leveraging this trend um, and establishing distributed private traffic exchanges around the world. I mentioned the um, use cases that we've analyzed uh, over the past few years, um, you know, upwards of 1,700 today. 
Um, and it's boiled down into four areas on the inner circle here. There's the network optimization, which in, includes your content delivery network, your DNS and global traffic management. This is often seen as the first step uh, towards digitization. Uh, companies look at software-defined networking. They look at simplifying their firewall and proximity solutions. Um, and we must remember that you know, without a significantly uh, cohesive global traffic management system, there is no data transfer. You know, it, the IP itself is your business. That data is your business. We then see organizations almost move through a maturity model and start to adopt infrastructure as a service. Software as a service, such as you know, Workday from HR, or maybe even uh, other platforms to provide fleet management and logistics in time. And then we also see the mobility and the web requirement coming from our users who you know, travel, uh, maybe even they hot desk, we still define those as distributed users. They're not tied to one machine all the time or one location all the time. And as you move through this maturity model, we start to talk about distributed security. I do have these people out there. I do have these clouds providing services to my business. How do I make sure that my data is not escaping? How do I make sure that I'm protected from uh, DDoS or intrusion protection? And then we look at distributed data. Um, and this is the ability to access the right data at the right time in the right geography. With GDPR, European Data Protection, uh, you know, Sarbanes Oxley, everyone has some type of regulatory and compliance requirements for that country or, or even that continent. So we need to make sure that certain things don't come out of the country, maybe personal information, maybe financial information. So we need to start thinking about the distributed data and how we analyze where it's being accessed and how it's being accessed. The common trend through all of these, as you'll see on the outside, is the word distributed. It does need to get everywhere, it does need to touch everyone, and it does need to do everything. So how do we uh, address this? How do we work through this? And indeed, we often have a conversation, you know, how do I move from legacy? I'm very familiar with a lot of the things that happen within my data center. I'm very familiar with how much it costs, how much the ongoing OPEX and CAPEX refresh are, and I'm fully aware that I've got to keep this available to my business at a manageable cost layer. But then there are other things that start creeping in, like the additional network costs to provide these services. And the fact that I'm bringing the world to me, um, does that really scale going forward? There are a lot of sunk costs associated with this, um, and a lot of companies we are seeing today understand this constraint. Um, and indeed, they are looking to move to a, almost a cloud, purely cloud-based um, architecture. That works in some organizations, especially with the startups, um, you know, who have no budgets and they need to run a very lean uh, operating expense. But for those that are more established, they understand the need for proximity of the services that matter to the cloud, but retaining ownership of the base. Cloud can look very inexpensive, um, but uh, when it comes to it, you have things like the API access points, you have various other services associated with it. It's not just the CPU, memory, and storage. So there comes a tipping point where you have to understand that there is a lot you need to own, but that owned information, infrastructure, data, et cetera, needs proximity to the cloud being uh, services being provided. So that's where Equinix talks through their hybrid multi-cloud model. Um, and a lot of this uh, is based on two areas. Firstly, cost optimization. You need to save money, you need to make sure you're spending it correctly, um, and you need to make sure that where you're spending that money is, uh, <clears throat> is a secure environment. And the second side of it is the bandwidth capabilities. Now, with the internet, of course, you, know, you are limited to your network service provider's connection to your office, um, and they can provide uh, you know, very strong, healthy, uh, large connections, but at a cost. Within an Equinix data center, for example, a cost of a one gigabit connection would be between two and 300 euros a month uh, just for the connection. So you can see how the, um, the data throughput on that is more cost effective than bringing the world back to your office. The other side of hybrid multi-cloud is the ability to access multiple clouds through a single connection. 
So what if you could have a 10 gigabit connection to the word cloud and then virtually slice up uh, that connection to multiple service providers? Maybe that's F5 Silverline for DDoS, Oracle Cloud for your business warehouse, you know, Azure, Google AWS for your front end services, all manageable through your private connection to this service. As it says, over 97% of all infrastructure as a service compute capacity is available either directly, uh, privately connecting through Cloud Exchange itself. So, before we move on to the use cases uh, that we've got in hand, I'm just going to talk through some of the digital uh, trends that we're seeing today. With the rapid adoption of custom design, telematics, and advanced connected services, Manufacturing companies are reinventing revenue and service models. To satisfy these emerging needs, data collection and uses must move closer to the source at the digital edge. This strategy requires multiple control points to enable ubiquitous access and high speed secure data capture with multiple parties. So why are they doing that? Well, manufacturing digitization is accelerating uh, the revenue and reducing costs. We saw that earlier. Um, interconnection of manufacturing companies for collaboration, things, and data is becoming essential. And indeed, streamlining to multi-party information exchanges and real-time insights and capabilities are becoming essential to how uh, we deliver excellent service to uh, our intake customers today. So what are the constraints that we're seeing? Well, there is the throughput variability. The uncontrolled cost limits uh, of manufacturing profitability takes a dent and takes a toll today. There is almost a linear innovation uh, within lots of organizations. It's not that it's, it's stagnant. What it is, is it is disconnected between the designers, the makers, and the supply chain. So we're looking for more collaborative um, capabilities to move this forward. A lot of the processes today are often siloed. And once you're siloed, it provides an inability to collaborate inside and outside the organization, which can be seen to hinder progress. And the biggest constraint we see today is the lack of consumer insight. Business archetypes tend to be monolithic. So what would we like our future state capabilities to be? We'd like controlled costs. We would like to provide the capability to continually optimize cost performance. We'd like dynamic R&D, the ability to meet the needs of and demands of our customers. Integrated supply chain has been talked about significantly, so we would like to better manage the inventory and pricing controls. And real-time insights. You know, what if we could control and customize and track production? Uh, what if we knew at that moment in time something needed changing? We have a, a great story we, we talk about with the uh, energy market. Uh, it's around the drill head, you know, requiring changing every, uh, every period of time when it becomes worn. Now they're at the point with IoT and data analytics where they can say, well, we'll do this at the next shift change because that will save an, uh, downtime and will further optimize production. We know there's a window where we have to change it. Can it coincide with many other things? So we're working through a lot of those with our customers today. Um, and indeed, we are seeing peering customers uh, deploying into more locations to improve user experience and things uh, like data sharing, analytic capabilities. Also, um, we see them adopt cloud services and, de and deploy direct interconnections with their partners. So what's changed? You know, why are companies doing this today? Well, it's a digital economy and a digital era. Information sharing, things explosion, customer engagements, they are all shifting to digital. So what does this mean? Well, it means we have to have the need to improve user experience across more device types, in more locations, and pushing network controls and functions to the digital edge. So how do we help solve this? The main kicker here is usually around latency. We have to reduce the transport costs by reshortening the distance between users, between employees, and indeed between other enterprises so we can localize the traffic. This does a couple of things. You know, it takes a lot of the information and data off of your corporate network and puts it at the digital edge where these things meet. 
We also see that data sources are shifting to things and clouds. This requires a new architecture offering, direct interconnection to clouds, partners, and ecosystems with closer proximity to consumers and things is required. So what we solve for complexity here, we direct connect and segment public and private clouds securely and more efficiently along with the partners. And we always call this a meet me at Equinix thing. Because at Equinix, this is where the internet exchanges sit, it's where the cloud sits, and it's where the customer's data sits. We also see the change in compliance requirements. They're getting higher, um, they're not getting less. The risk of security breaches with things and shifting workloads to clouds is changing architectures. It requires new security solutions. The integrated models require multi-party workflows and secure data exchanges with security controls in places where they're needed. So how do we help here? Well, we solve for the integration piece. We position the security components with the security ecosystem connectivity. I mentioned earlier that once you're deployed in multiple locations, do you need to have security endpoints at all those locations? You know, and what's the trade-off versus, versus doing that all centrally? And these are all types of things that come up in the security design. The other thing that's changed is the data exchange between things and partners and plants. And this leads to new information architecture and solutions being required. Large volumes of data must be accessed, moved, exchanged, secured, and protected across all stage, uh, devi all devices across the stage in a compliant manner. You need to know where it is, who it's going to, um, and is it being used in the right way. And this only comes when you start solving for scale. When you think about how to manage data exchanges globally by growing to the hub to support the information exchanges, the analytics in a compliant hosting environment. So what I'm gonna do now is just take you through uh, three use cases that we have today. Um, and the first one is from A6. Um, you know, it's an organization that we're all familiar with. Uh, if you're into running and sports and everything, and uh, need a nice pair of trainers, these are the guys that you tend to buy. Um, so they obviously had a challenge uh, moving from their data centers um, to an Equinix IBX, and they were doing this for multiple reasons. The primary reason is they acknowledged that they were not a data center manager and provider, um, and it cost them a lot of money to keep this runtime up. The other side of it was they were scaling beyond their means. Um, they were having to recruit a lot more uh, internal resources to provide future functions to the business. So what did they do? Well, they re-architected their solution based on Equinix Cloud Exchange Fabric. Um, there's a bit of technical information on there that you can read through, but the result was they have a fully flexible environment that they can scale to meet not just the needs of their internal business, but their partners, supply chain, and provide a consistent customer experience um, through their uh, omni-channel uh, presence. The second one is the Coca-Cola European Partners. Now these, uh, as you can see, a European leader in fast-moving consumer goods. So these guys produce all the bottling, they provide all the vending machines for the Coca-Cola brand. Um, and they quite clearly stated that they had to have a cloud-focused interconnection first strategy and they knew that this would drive further efficiencies throughout the business they knew it would take costs out of their expansion into other regions um, and it would optimize the way the business uh, works with each other uh, across the region so they looked at the interconnection oriented architecture that we provided um, and they designed their own strategy based on platform Equinix and we architected for the digital edge as a result, yes, they saved money, but more importantly, they improved connectivity to their cloud partners. They are able to work in a true DevOps fashion. They are able to deliver applications and services in a more meaningful manner and in a significantly less amount of time. Also importantly is when they go to a new market, they will be able to um, spin up infrastructure as a service. They will be able to software define that service or network edge uh, features, and they will be able to continue to create the secure, resilient, connected business that they've designed from day one. 
And now we flip uh, to Constantia Flexibles. Now, um, it's not a name that you may be familiar with, but all the flexible packaging uh, and labeling is, is done by these guys in <coughs> out of Frankfurt and across EMEA in the US. Again, they had to have a, a solution whereby they could consolidate many of their IT sites into uh, primary data center locations with access to cloud, with access to networks, with access to the internet. Um, and they understood that Equinix was able to provide this nexus point for them. So again, they used the interconnection oriented architecture um, to design and deploy on platform Equinix. Now I've mentioned interconnection oriented architecture a couple of times. Um, it, what it is, it's a, um, it's a, a uh, interconnection oriented architecture is a strategy by which you can design and implement solutions based on a lot of research that Equinix uh, has provided to the market. If you want, please have a look at ioakb.com um, and you can see the design blueprints uh, yourselves. So these have been verified with uh, various uh, partners such as 451, Gartner, Forrester, and indeed customers themselves so that we can help un customers understand the stages they need to go through to adopt an interconnection oriented architecture or cloud first strategy. For example, when you want to de-risk the business, you know, distributed digital technologies and the adoption of IoT devices in manufacturing dramatically increase, increase data risk. New partner integrations broaden security exposure and challenge overall compliance uh, postures. So today, you know, the, some of the constraints around that would be legacy IT architectures are complex and expensive to operate. And some of the market forces uh, around compliance, privacy regulation, and even uh, the new entrants disrupting some of these businesses uh, provide a, a real challenge. So manufacturing companies are reducing their business risk by simplifying and standardizing on a single global interconnection platform that enhances collaboration and streamlines innovation. So if we have a look through some of these uh, uh, blueprints um, down the road, uh, please make sure you, you ask me about them again. Um, we can have a, a look through not just the security layer, but the network layer, the application, and indeed how you bring all of this together uh, in a strategic architecture. So uh, on that note, uh, I think we're running to time. Um, I'm going to hand back to Peter. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yes, as you can see, thank you very much for that. Um, as you can see on the screen, we've got one more poll question. So uh, before we go to uh, a little bit of discussion about some of the issues Andrew raised, perhaps we can see that poll question. And uh, perhaps you could answer that just very quickly. Uh, click on those for us. Yes, I can see that uh, very strong preponderance, uh, two thirds at least, saying that uh, interconnection is going to be critical um, in digital transformation journeys. Andrew, yeah, that's about, uh, as I say, two thirds. Um, pretty much mirrors how it was at the beginning, um, but an awful lot more people are aware now um, of, uh, of the importance of interconnection. Uh, I imagine that's something that reassures you. Oh, it, it absolutely does. Um, and some of this is, you know, terminology. A lot of the companies think, well, maybe I'm actually doing this and I'm just not calling it uh, what it is. Um, and then once you've identified what it is, you can um, understand its significance and where it's, uh, where it's important to your business going forward. Um, I mean, interconnection is everything uh, today. You know, it's how we do business. It takes us from being a one-to-one uh, -one phone call to an online collaborative uh, um, uh, webinar like we're having today. You, you know, talk once to multiple people uh, or indeed, uh, as we see in businesses, you have a really good uh, energetic co collaboration uh, between companies, people and places. So, yes, very good to see. I'm, I'm really intrigued, um, and I'm sure that uh, people who are focusing on ROI, which of course is massively important, it's easy just to take all this for granted, but uh, how, how do you actually measure the potential success of, um, of going deep into this infrastructure layer? Um, because digital transformation has got so many facets to it, from you know, applications um, in, in, your, in, your, in your factory right the way through to in, uh, digital infrastructure. How do you actually measure success? 
A, a very good question. And a lot of organizations that have a, a mature or advanced dynamic uh, approach to this, they will actually understand that it, it's not about how much IT is costing so much. Um, it's more about the fluid transfer of information, requirements, and execution um, that that company has. So we start to talk about understanding the multiple digital edges that customers have. One of them is going to be on their consumer base. One of them is going to be with their partners and suppliers. You know, another one is actually their business itself. So when you start to simplify uh, the infrastructure services being provided, when you start to simplify how they are consumed, um, and how you move into more of a dynamic service provisioning of these, you start to realize that you know, there, are in, there are tangible cost savings to be had that you hadn't considered in the past. And that flows through into you know, cost savings, but more importantly, uh, budget reinvestment in the right areas. And that can be for training for the next wave of technology. That can be for reskilling staff uh, to support the future mode of operation. So companies look at uh, a more of a holistic model as opposed to just licensing, hardware costs, et cetera, um, and they move into uh, more of the ITIL and the Six Sigma of efficiencies. You know, if I'm able to provide a tool that helps somebody work X percent faster, well, then there's more volume that can be put through there, and the velocity at which that uh, exercise happens increases and thereby improves efficiencies. And they start to measure that as well. So we see in a lot of business cases that yes, there is always going to be the procurement runtime and how much is this going to cost and save me? But more and more mature enterprises are now looking for and how much more can I do? How much more capable will I be? And is that going to give me a competitive edge in the market as well? So that's interesting. How do you think enterprise organizations will end up maximizing the use of their digital edge? So, as I mentioned, there are a few areas that you, know, you would call a digital edge. Um, there is the consumer side. You know, these are the customers that buy from you. How, that, how they adopt and how they consume your service is one thing. That has to be streamlined. It has to be efficient. It has to be performant. The customer experience is everything. Um, I know if I get in my car and the kids have been in the back, it's a real mess and it's not a comfortable journey for me. But once I've cleaned it at the Saturday, Sunday's drive is wonderful. So I need to have that type of uh, mentality when I'm thinking about you know, delivering customer service. It's the application, it's the data, it's how much you can help them uh, with uh, the, their adoption of your service. The other side is your business. You know, how are they going to be more efficient going forward? How are they going to indeed help drive uh, customer satisfaction? And their customers are not just external, they're internal as well. And then, of course, there is the supply chain and the partner ecosystem. How can we make that more collaborative? How can we make sure that what we're doing will also help our partners, which in turn will reap rewards through cost optimization and significant service improvements? Yeah, I think the, the, the way this is obviously going to go is, is businesses see other businesses take advantage uh, of, of this, the, the tremendous power that interconnection gives them. Um, and, and they're going to be able to learn from what other businesses, maybe their customers or their suppliers are, are, are doing. And that is the way uh, they, they can perhaps maximize their own potential. Absolutely right, Peter. And you know, manufacturers are uniquely positioned to interact directly with consumers across a variety of channels. They're able to servicize product offerings and gain new insights into new opportunities. They have this unique perspective and ability to harvest real-time customer and market data. Um, they deliver omni-channel predictive insights. Uh, which enables them to communicate cross channels and content to seamlessly work together regardless of the user experience channel. And they're also dynamically uh, able to adapt partner value chains. So this is seamlessly onboarding, offboarding partners uh, and providers to support innovative offerings uh, and meet consumer needs. We often talk about partner integration, um, but it's important to remember that you need to be able to egress from certain relationships as things change. As new disruptors come into the market, you may want to adopt that over the one you have. 
So they may be key to your strategy and innovation, but how do you swap them out for somebody else? Well, Andrew, thank you very much indeed for that. I can uh, see that time is running away from us. So uh, before we sign off, I'd, I'd like to learn a little bit more. And here I'm talking to um, our audience. Um, if you'd like to learn more about interconnection and the opportunities it offers your business, please just click on this question here and uh, Andrew's team are going to get in touch with you directly. This is an opportunity for you to speak one-on-one um, -on -one with them about any of the issues raised. Uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds to do that. While we're doing that, just a reminder that we're going to send all registrants uh, a link to the on-demand version of this webinar over the next few days and that's going to include all our contact details uh, actually you can see them on the screen right there um, should you have any questions and uh, thank you very much indeed for uh, completing this uh, this little uh, questionnaire if you've got just a couple more seconds to do that that'd be great thank you very much indeed um, a huge thank you to Equinix, a huge thank you to Andrew McCreth. Thanks, Andrew. Hope you enjoyed the presentation, Andrew. It, I, th I thought it went really well. Thank you very much for having us today, Peter. Really appreciate it. Okay. Well, we hope you in the audience enjoyed the presentation. Uh, that's all from us here at the webinar for today. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, my name's Nick Peters. Uh, goodbye for now.